There were uh, certain things that happened during this battle and certain lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in this surah. <coughs> the Joint Forces. The Medina surah, which gets its title from the incident of the Battle of the Trench in 627. When the joint force of the various tribes of the disbelievers besieged Medina, the believers dug a ditch, which the disbelievers were unable to cross, and eventually the enemy retreated in disarray. This is mentioned in order to remind the believers of God's goodness to them, so that they may obey the numerous instructions given in the surah, starting with the regulation of adoption and including proper conduct towards the Prophet Sallallahu and his wives. The hypocrites are warned to stop their bad behavior. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. Prophet, so I said, be mindful of God and do not give up and do not give in to the disbelievers and the hypocrites. God is all knowing, all wise. Follow what your Lord reveals to you. God is well aware of all your actions. Put your trust in God. God is enough to trust. God does not put two hearts within a man's breast. He does not turn the wives you reject and liken to your mother's backs into your real mothers. Nor does he make your adopted sons into real sons. These are only words from your mouths, while God speaks the truth and guides people to the right path. Name your adopted sons after their real fathers. This is more equitable in God's eyes. If you do not know who their fathers are, they are your brothers in religion and protégés. You will not be blamed if you make a mistake, only for what your hearts deliberately intend. God is most forgiving and merciful. The prophet is closer to the believers than they are themselves, while his wives are their mothers. In God's scripture, blood relatives have a stronger claim than other believers and immigrants, though you may still bestow gifts on your protégés. All this is written in the scripture. Okay, so in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he starts off by telling the Prophet وسلم, to be firm in terms of his faith and put his faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to give in to the demands of the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that a person doesn't have two hearts in his chest. Right? Either he submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely or he submits to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if a person is trying to do both, say that okay, he worships Allah, but he worships other than Allah, he can't do that. They can't coexist. Tawheed and shirk cannot coexist. Sunnah and bid'ah cannot coexist. Okay, so we need to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following his message Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if we say certain things, they don't make it a reality. Okay, what does that mean? And we talked a little bit about bihar, we'll talk about it again sort of mujadila. If a person goes to his wife, and tells her that he, she is like the back of his mother, meaning that he's saying that he's not going to have relations with her, then that does not literally make him, make her his mother. But there's a punishment that needs to be paid for that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned that Surah Mujadira. Here, if a person adopts somebody and says, this is my son, that does not make him or her the biological son or daughter of that individual. So Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu, before this verse was revealed, he was known as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd, the son of Muhammad. Because the Prophet ﷺ had taken him as an adopted son. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that don't do that. You can adopt people, fine, have a good relationship with them, but don't change their name. Call him by his father's name. Call him Zayd ibn Harith. Or if you don't know what his father's name is, call him your brother in faith, but don't call him your son. Because he's not your son. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, okay, say that you treat him like a son and you think of him as a son, but he's not your son but, uh, in, by accident. You say, okay, this is my son. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you won't be held responsible for that. Okay? But you have to have that child understand that he is not your son and you have to make him know that he does have a biological father, but you can consider him very close and take care of him, things like that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and Nabi Awla bil Mu'minina min anfusim wa azwaja wa mahatum. The believer 
prefers and loves the Prophet ﷺ more than he loves himself. And the mother, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are the mothers of the believers. Okay? So it's not allowed for any believer, it wasn't allowed for any believer to marry the wives of the Prophet ﷺ after he passed away. Because they were like their mothers. And the last thing mentioned in this uh, section is that before this ayah was revealed, people, instead of giving their inheritance to their blood brothers and blood sisters, they would, as long as they were on the same faith, right, they would give it to their close friends or the people that the Prophet said joined them between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse says that if your brothers are on the same faith as you, then they are more entitled to inheritance than people who may be very, very close to you, such as your friends. Okay? This is what this verse is referring to. We took a solemn pledge from the Prophets, from you, Muhammad Sallallahu from Nuh Salaam, from Ibrahim Salaam, from Moses, from Jesus, the son of Mary. We took a solemn pledge from all of them. God will question even the truthful about their sincerity, and for those who reject the truth, He has prepared a painful torment. You believe. Remember God's goodness to you when mighty armies massed against you. We sent a violent wind and invisible forces against them. God sees all that you do. They massed against you from above and below. Your eyes rolled with fear. Your hearts rose in your throats, and you thought ill thoughts of God. There are the believers. There are the believers were solely tested and deeply shaken. The hypocrites and the sick at heart said, God and his messengers promised us nothing but delusions. Some of them said, people of Yitra, you will not be able to withstand the attack, so go back. Some of them asked the prophet's permission to leave, saying, our houses are exposed, even though they were not. They just wanted to run away. Had the city been invaded from all sides and the enemy invited them to rebel, they would have done so almost without hesitation. Yet they had already promised God that they would not turn tail and flee and a promise to God will be answered for. Prophets like Salaam say, running away will not benefit you. If you manage to escape death or slaughter, you will only be permitted to enjoy life for a short while. Say, if God wishes to harm you, who can protect you? If God wishes to show you mercy, who can prevent him? They will find no one but God to protect or help them. God knows exactly who among you hinder others, who secretly say to their brothers, come and join us, who hardly ever come out to fight, who begrudge you believers in any help, when fear comes, you prophesy son of see them looking at you with eyes rolling like someone in their death throes. When fear has passed, they attack you with sharp tongues and begrudge you any good. Such men do not believe, and God brings their deeds to nothing. That is all too easy for God. They think the joint forces have not gone, and if the joint forces did come again, they would wish they were in the desert, wandering among the Bedouin and seeking news about you from a safe distance. Even if they were with you believers, they would hardly fight at all. The messenger of God Salaam, is an excellent model for those of you who put your hope in God and the last day and remember him often. So the first set of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the universality of Islam. Same message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the Prophet Sallallahu the same message that he took and the Responsibilities of the Prophet are the same responsibility of Nuh Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verses 9 to 21, He talks about the response of the hypocrites to the Ghazwat al Ahzab when they heard that people were gathered against them. How did they respond? What were they thinking about? Right, so all of these things are mentioned that they tried, they were so scared, and it's not that they were. It's not bad to be scared, but they tried to find excuses. They tried to say, okay, uh, we have to go back home because our houses are exposed. They thought that if they had fled and ran away, that they themselves would have been safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, safety, security is not in the people's hands, but that's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they would also say that if uh, this happened again, they would want to be in the desert far, far away from any harm, and they tried to find out news while they themselves would not follow any command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this set of verses is telling us that if we're challenged with something, put your faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get you out through any difficulty. So you see the contrast, right? When you just read this, and you uh, read this part, this is how the disbelievers, they are the disbelievers or the hypocrites, respond to adversity, respond to challenges. In the last part of this, though, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, verse 21, that in the Messenger of Allah وسلم, you have the best example for you. Right? And especially for those that uh, believe in the last day and put their faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. So in verse 22 to 27, you see that how the believers respond. Same situation. Right? Huge group of people are coming to attack the Muslims. You saw how the hypocrites are going to have responded. And now you're going to see how the believers respond. When the believers saw the joint forces, they said, This is what God and His Messenger promised us. The promise of God and His Messenger is true. And this only served to increase their faith and submission to God. There are men among the believers who honored their pledge to God. Some of them have fulfilled it by death, and some are still waiting. They have not changed in the least. Such trials are ordained so that God may reward the truthful for their honesty and punish the hypocrites. If He so wills, or He may relent towards them, for God is forgiving and merciful. God sent back the disbelievers along with their rage. They gained no benefit and spared the believers from fighting. He is strong and mighty. He brought those people of the book who supported them down from their strongholds and put panic into their hearts. Some of them you believers killed and some you took captive. He, he passed on to their land, their houses, their possessions, and a land where you had not set foot. God has power over everything. What happened was, during the Ghazwat al-Ahzab, the Prophet وسلم, he had a treaty with the Jews that if they were attacked, that the Jews would come out and help and support and defend the Muslims. And they didn't do that. Not only did they not do that, some of them, they actually knew that the men and the men that were in the Ghazwat al-Ahzab, where that was taking place. So some of them they went and they tried to attack Medina or get information in Medina. So the Prophet, alhamdulillah, the woman they found them, they fought them off and they made them go back. But when the Prophet came back from Ahzab, Ahzab, the people weren't able to cross the trench, there was wind, so the people left. The ten thousand that were there, they left without any battle having taken place. When the Prophet went back and to Medina, even before he put his armor down, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said that, are you going to put your armor down when the angels have not even put off down their armor? Go to the group of Jews that tried to attack you while they were supposed to be trying to defend you and uh, help you and support you. So the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims went immediately and here's what happened. Yes, they did kill some of them. They did uh, take over their land and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had fortified themselves. And this is mentioned in Surah Hashr, the Ben Madid. They fortified themselves. They put themselves in a fort. And they're like, okay, how are the Muslims going to get through this? So after a number of days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَذَ فَفِي قُلُوبِهِمْ الْبُعْرِ That Allah, He put them behind the fort, yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has access to their hearts. So He put terror and fear in their hearts that they came to the Prophet and they said, okay, we submit. We messed up, we're wrong, we're going to leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then allowed them to be exiled from the land. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, he passed on to you their land, their houses, their possession, and a land where you had not set foot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over everything. Okay. Um, so we just finished, uh, we're about to finish the 21st just, but if you look, the uh, surah is just a few more pages long, inshallah, we'll finish the surah in about 20 minutes. We'll finish the surah and tomorrow we'll start with the surah, inshallah. <clears throat> Prophet, so say to your wives, if, you, if your desire is for the present life and its finery, 
Then come, I will make provision for you and release you with kindness. But if you desire God, his messenger, and the final home, then remember that God has prepared great rewards for those of you who do good. Wives of the prophet, if any of you does something clearly outrageous, she will be double, doubly punished. That is easy for God. But if any of you is obedient to God and his messenger and does good deeds, know that we shall give her a double reward and have prepared a generous provision for her. Wives of the prophet, you are not like any other woman. If you are truly mindful of God, do not speak too softly in case the sick at the heart should lust after you, but speak in an appropriate manner. Stay at home and do not flaunt your finery as they used to do in the pagan past. Keep up the prayer, give the prescribed alms, and obey God and his messenger. God wishes to keep uncleanliness away from you, people of the prophet's house, and to purify you thoroughly. Remember what is recited in your houses of God's revelations and wisdom, for God is all subtle, all aware. For men and women who are devoted to God, believing men and women, obedient men and women, truthful men and women, steadfast men and women, humble men and women, charitable men and women, fasting men and women, chaste men and women, men and women who remember God often, God has prepared forgiveness and a rich reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this set of ayat, he addresses the lives of the Prophet sallallahu And some of them, they wanted more in terms of the dunya, right? And this is something which is natural. Sometimes people, they want more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if you want the dunya, then he'll give them the dunya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you desire Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that as well. So all of them, right? All of them chose to be with Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned the characteristics of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wives are examples for all of our sisters, all of our mothers, all of the people. So He talks to them and tells them, addresses them. And one of the things that He mentioned, is that um, don't let this uh, before I go on that don't let that part there's this one part that some people they think that this is only for the Prophet's wives uh, why is the Prophet you are not like any other woman what does that mean you are not like any other woman does that mean that this is only for you or does this mean that you have higher standards it means you have higher standards Right? Some people say, no, uh, or talking to people in an unflattering way or unflirtatious way. This is only for the Prophet's wives. No, that's not what it means. This means that you have higher standards. Don't, if women in the community, in the society that you live in, right, flaunt themselves or talk to people in ways that are, uh, you know, flirtatious, you can't do that. Why? Because you have higher morals, you have higher values, and you are supposed to set the example. So, uh, when we talk to people, especially the opposite gender, right? Don't speak too softly in case the sick at heart should lust after you, but speak in an appropriate manner. You don't have to be rude, you don't have to be coarse or rough, right? But you don't engage in things unnecessarily, right? You don't give people the wrong idea, the wrong impression, okay? Because look, even though you say that, um, look, I didn't mean anything like that, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is he talking about referring people to? People have sickness in their hearts. Even though you may be not mean anything like that, that person, he's sick in his heart. So don't give him anything that he may be able to use against you, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to, uh, stay at your home and do not flaunt your finery as they used to in the pagan past, right? Even in the times of the hijab of the past, they may have covered their hair, but they would leave their chest exposed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't do that. ula. Right, establish a salah, give the zakah, and obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to purify you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take care of you. How is He taking care of you? He by doing these things to you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, sometimes, uh, I think it was Ibn Salama radiallahu anha, some of the Sahabiyat went to her and said, everything that's revealed is regarding the men. What about us? So, the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first thing, answer to that, <coughs> is anything that is revealed is both for men and women. Okay? Unless there's something that's specific to the woman, such as hijab and jibab, as we'll talk about coming up, inshallah. But here, even though that's true, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to reassure them. 
ان المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم الحافظ والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات عند الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما. Okay, all of them, believing men, believing women, all of them are mentioned here. Just جبر الخواتم. جبر الخواتم is that sometimes people uh, they may be fragile, right? And then when the women are asking that, right, Prophet said very easily consent. Everything that's revealed has to do with you, except for that which is specific. Everything that reveals for the men applies to you as well. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took it a step further and just to reassure them, revealed this ayat. The next set of ayat is going to be talking about the divorce of Zayd ibn Haritha to Zainab radiallahu anha and the subsequent marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Zainab radiallahu anha. When God and His Messenger have decided on the matter that concerns them, it is not fitting for any believing man or woman to claim freedom of choice in that matter. Whoever disobeys God and his messenger is far astray. When you prophesy some said to the man who had been favored by God and by you, keep your wife and be mindful of God. You hid in your heart what God would later reveal. You were afraid of people, but it is more fitting that you fear God. When Zayd no longer wanted her, we gave her to you in marriage, so that, so that there might be no fault in believers marrying the wives of their adopted sons after they no longer wanted them. God's command must be carried out. The prophet is not at fault for what God has ordained for him. This was God's practice with those who went before. God's command must be fulfilled, and with all those who deliver God's messages and fear only him and no other. God's reckoning is enough. Muhammad is not the father of any of you men. He is God's messenger and the seal of the prophets. God knows everything. Believers, remember God often and glorify him morning and evening. It is He who blesses you as your angels in order to lead you out of the depths of darkness into light, into the light. He is ever merciful towards the believers. When they meet Him, they will be greeted with peace, and He has prepared a generous reward for them. Prophet Sallallahu we have sent down, we have sent you as a witness, as a bearer of good news and warning, as one who calls people to God by His lead, as a light-giving lamp. Give the believers the good news that the great bounty awaits them from God. Do not give in to the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Ignore the harm they cause you and put your trust in God. God is enough to trust. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this set of ayah, first he says that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides and legislates, it's not for a believer to say that, okay, I want to do this, I don't want to do this. Right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that we have to pray five times a day, right? no believer should go and say, no, I only want to pray three. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you have to fast the month of Ramadan, it's not appropriate or allowed for a believer to say that, no, I want to fast the month of Rajab. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees, we say, Samir Nalatan, we hear and we obey. What happened here was, the Prophet sallallahu he was very very close to Zayd right? and he, as I said he was like his adopted son and Zainab she was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu so the Prophet sallallahu he got them married okay? within a year they had a little bit of conflict right? and the Prophet sallallahu said try to make it work try to uh, you know, patch things up but it wasn't working. They just had personality conflicts. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for Zayd radiallahu anhu to divorce Zainab. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for the Prophet وسلم, to marry Zainab radiallahu anhu. Okay. Here, a couple lessons here. Number one, we have Zayd radiallahu anhu. The Prophet وسلم, he loved him. And he said, I love Zayd and I love the son of Zayd, Usama radiallahu he said, Usama radiallahu Usama bin Zayd, Prophet said, I love Usama and I love his father. Okay? So, if Zayd radiallahu wasn't a good person, would the Prophet sallallahu say that he loves him? No. Who did Zayd radiallahu end up marrying? Anybody know? No. 
Zayd radiallahu anhu ended up marrying Umm Hayman radiallahu anhu. Umm Hayman radiallahu anhu, who is she? She was the one, not even, not even do Khadijah. She was before. She was the one when the Prophet lost his mother. She took care of him and brought him back to Medina, uh, from Medina to Mecca. So the Prophet وسلم, he learned about Ethiopia from her, Abyssinia from her, learned about their food from her. So she was much older. But the Prophet وسلم, loved her like he loved her his mother because she played the role of his mother. Okay? So she ended up marrying Zayd ibn Haritha and they had Usama radiallahu anhu. Okay. Zainab radiallahu anha. She was known as Umm al-Masakeen. She was a cousin of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after she divorced uh, Zayd radiallahu anhu and her got divorced, who ended up marrying her? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If she was a bad person, if she was a mother of the believers, as she is, as, as she is, would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have married her? No. So what happened? They weren't good for each other. And that's sometimes what happens in divorce. So I know sometimes we put stigmas. Oh, the person was bad, that's for, therefore they got divorced. No, that's not how Islamically it works. They may, they are, without a doubt, the situation proves that they're bad, excellent people. Zayd radiallahu is the only companion mentioned by name in the Quran. But they just weren't good for each other. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the Prophet has nothing to be shy about when it comes to his marriages, because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for him. And then he says that the Prophet has no children, but he's the last of the Prophets. Then he talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored the believers. And he talks about the Prophet that the Prophet is a witness is a giver of good news, is a warner, is a caller, uh, is a clear lamp that guides people towards what is beneficial for them in this dunya and the akhirah. And they have good news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites when it comes to disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> the next set of verses is going to be discussing uh, mahr. Okay, maha and marriage. Okay, you know how people sometimes they get, there's different stages in Islamic marriage. One is the nikah, the contract, right? And then there's a consummation when they start living together. So what happens if a person gets their contract done, but before they start living together, they get divorced? What is the idda in that terms, right? What is the idda, the waiting period, before the sister can get remarried? That's mentioned in the next ayat. Also, the marriages of the Prophet here are addressed as well. Believers, you have no right to expect a waiting period when you marry believing women and then divorce them before you have touched them. Make provision for them and release them in an honorable way. Prophet Sallallahu we have made lawful for you the wives whose bride gave you and any slaves God has assigned to you through war, and the daughters of your uncles and aunts on your father's and mother's sides, who migrated with you. Also, any believing woman who has offered herself to the Prophet, waiving any bride gift, and whom the Prophet wishes to wed. This is only for you, Prophet and not the rest of the believers. We know exactly what we have made obligatory for them concerning their wives and slave girls, so you should not be blamed. God is most forgiving and most merciful. You may, you may make any of your women wait and receive any of them as you wish, but you will not be at fault if you invite one of whose turn you have previously set aside. This way it is more likely that they will be satisfied and will not be distressed, and will be content with what you have given them. God knows what is in your hearts. God is all knowing and forbearing. You, Prophet Sallallahu are not permitted to take any further wives, nor to exchange the wives you have for others, even if this attract you with their even if these attract you with their beauty. But this is not applied to your slave girls. God is watchful over you. Okay, in a normal divorce, if a man divorces his wife, he has a certain amount of time in which he can call her back and they can reconcile and they can move on. Right? As long as the first divorce or the second divorce. And that is three cycles for women who have three cycles 
or if they have the regular cycles, three months if she's pregnant, it is uh, until she delivers the baby, things like that, right? It's all mentioned in different surahs in the Quran. But as far as this type of marriage where the uh, intimate nature hasn't taken place, the intimate relationship hasn't taken place, he has no right. He has no right to call her back. If he wants to remarry her, then they have to have a new contract and a new matter. So this is mentioned here. Also, um, the Prophet ﷺ is the only one that it is permissible, that it was permissible for a woman to say that she doesn't want, uh, she doesn't want any mahr. Khali that this is only for you, a messenger of Allah wasallam. Everybody else, they have to assign a mahr. And the woman can be like, you know what, I waive my mahr, that's fine. But the, the concept of mahr needs to be there. The only one who didn't have to give mahr is the Prophet ﷺ. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also put limits on the Prophet sallallahu saying that you can't marry anybody else now. Right? This is the Prophet sallallahu he was not allowed to marry anybody else after this. The next set of ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa got married to Zainab radiallahu anha, companions, they came in his house and they wouldn't leave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa out of his humility, out of his shyness, he never wanted to make anybody feel bad. But they were taking over on his rights. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the Prophet so much that he sent down ayat to protect the rights of his messengers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believers, do not enter the Prophet's apartment for a meal unless you are given permission to do so. Do not linger until a meal is ready. When you are invited, go in. Then when you have taken your meal, leave. Do not stay on and talk for that would offend the Prophet, though he would shrink from asking you to leave. God does not shrink from the truth. When you ask his wife for something, do so from behind a screen. This is pure, pure both for your hearts and for theirs. It is not right for you to offend God's messenger, just as you should never marry his wives after him. That would be grievous in God's eyes. God has full knowledge of all things, whether you reveal them or not. The Prophet's wives are not to blame if they are seen by their fathers, their sons, their brothers, their brothers' sons, their sisters' sons, their women, or their slaves. Wives of the Prophet, them. be mindful of God. God observes everything. God and His angels bless the Prophet. So you who believe, bless him too, and give greetings of peace. Those who insult God and His Messenger will be rejected by God in this world and the next. He has prepared a humiliating torment for them, and those who undeservedly insult believing men and women will bear the guilt of slander and flagrant sin. So here, uh, what I talked about is clear there. Also another part is The evidence that is used here is for the people that, uh, the, the ayah here is used as an evidence for people that say that the hijab, there needs to be a barrier, there needs to be a wall. Because here, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that that's better for the Prophet sallallahu companions and for his wives whose hearts were very, very pure. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these restrictions in order for shaitan not to have any entrance way. So what would happen during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, no, sorry, after the Prophet ﷺ, Arwa 